What's up fellow Among Us Poppets? I hope you're all having a fantastic day. Today we are looking into the deeply terrifying world of Netflix dating shows. That's how dogs do it! I am a dog. Yeah, I do feel it. I said terrifying, but what I mean is deeply disappointing. It's hard to explain. Netflix dating shows have made me feel a whole complex range of emotions. So as a warning, before we get into this video, I'd just like to say, Hold on to the moments of joy you've experienced up till now and cherish them because what you see here today may change you and not in a fun way. We are going to be digging deep into everything wrong with Netflix's dating shows. We're going straight to the core of the matter. We're going to examine three of Netflix's recent dating shows and try to make it out alive. We're looking at Too Hot to Handle, Love is Blind, and the final show I will just call Beast for YouTube purposes. And these shows all have one thing in common. They're terrible. They are absolutely terrible. They hurt your eyes, brain, and your soul. If you or a loved one has seen any of these shows, you may be entitled for compensation. Dial 111-222, your mom, for more details. No, but Netflix has the audacity to charge its viewers when really, after putting stuff like this on their platform, they should be paying you. Though this video is going to be a slightly informal rant on a lot of these shows, I'm also going to be highlighting some valid criticisms on these and try to figure out where Netflix went wrong and put forth the question, can they ever redeem themselves or will they continue their spiral downwards into the deepest pit of irrevocable mockery? Let's find out. Now sit back, relax, and really prepare yourself for the first show we're going to look into. All right, let's start this off with Too Hot to Handle. This show is certainly something. He does underestimate me and the alpha that I am. Hello, my little butter chicken. If I have to fight some girls off, I will. You sound like a pretty intellectual thinker. Does the clock start with a 12 or a 1? Constant use of the <laughs> in the Bloody hell. Hell. Let me start with explaining the premise. Too Hot the Handle pulls people from all around the world who they deem to be commitment phobic. These people are put on Too Hot to Handle in a desperate attempt at rehabilitation where they try to teach them how to have a proper relationship. These people are mainly used to their relationships being dating app hookups and Too Hot to Handle sees this as an Avengers level threat. The world will literally explode and everyone will perish if these people do not start getting into committed relationships. So, how does Too Hot to Handle aim to change the ways of its contestants? Well, first of all, they try to make sure that all contestants are hot to tempt each other, and then they put all contestants together on an island for a month where there are rules in place. And the rules consist of no kissing, no touching, and um, no kissing squared. Yeah, let's call it that. To make sure people don't break the rules, there's a giant prize pot of money, $100,000, and this money goes to whoever shows the most development over the course of the show. 100k may seem like a big amount, but it goes down with each rule violation. And to give you a sense of how much money is lost per rule break, a kiss costs 3k USD. A kiss. And these rules might seem easy to follow, like I'm sure many of you viewers would agree that it does not seem that hard to hold off on all of these actions for a month. But these people, unlike you and I, struggle immensely. When they saw the rules being established, they went through all the stages of grief. <gasps> oh my god! <laughs> Some contestants on the show tried to get away with discreet rule breaks, but that didn't happen. They were constantly being monitored. And now a curious mind may be wondering, who exactly ensures they are not kissing, squared, ing each other in private? Who is watching all of this? Well, the rule enforcer is none other than some disturbing little all-seeing Alexa oil diffuser hybrid named Lana. Lana mercilessly stalks the contestants on Too Hot to Handle and penalizes them if they break the rules. And they break the rules a lot. There was a breach of the rules. You have lost $3,000. Cost $3,000. $16,000. $20,000. Three thousand dollars. Twenty-one thousand dollars. In four thousand dollars of twenty thousand dollars. 
Yeah, the main takeaway people get from watching this for the first time is the cringe of these moments. But in addition to that, the structure of the show also has a ton of issues. The show format is terrible. At the beginning, the main cast is introduced, and they all coexist for a bit. Then, Lana randomly decides to send people home for really dumb reasons. Take Peter, for example. Peter was basically sent home for disrupting the peace of the group environment. The reason why he got sent home is because he kissed two girls that already belonged to guys. Somehow on the second day of being there, these girls were apparently too committed for Peter to make a move simply because these girls had shown a slight connection with the other guys. I also have to ask the question, why is the blame on Peter in the first place for this? The girls agreed to kiss him, it's not like they didn't have agency over their actions, they were actually pretty enthusiastic about it. This situation happened in episode 2, he got sent home in episode 5. Between episode 2 and 5, Peter really didn't pull anything else like that. He respected boundaries more because, well, the boundaries started being set and sending him home was a completely delayed response that made no sense. Especially for a show that has the main goal of observing the development of its cast. I can't think of any other show that removes people in such a delayed, nonsensical manner. Most reality shows eliminate people in a consistent manner, like one per episode, one per two episodes, something like that. Or, if someone broke the rules of the show and is disqualified, it will be made incredibly clear that they're going to be sent home for that reason. But that does not happen on Too Hot to Handle. When someone is eliminated, it comes out of nowhere, and it is entirely Lana's decision. In addition to this, at midpoint of the season, a few new people are brought onto the show, which is also ridiculous because the point of the show is to form connections with the people there. The ones who are brought on after are at an immediate disadvantage. There is no advantage to coming on late, there is only the disadvantage of not being able to form a relationship with someone because everyone already has a partner. It's absurd, it does not make sense. Now, one of my biggest issues with Too Hot to Handle is that it's trying to be deeper than it actually is. I understand that some of this is ironic, but not all of it is. The narrator often pokes fun at the absurd show premise and contestants, but some parts of the show actually try to suggest there's some serious personal growth and development going on here. They've learned lessons in maturity, inner strength. We are girls, we are in power, we are strong. And communication. They've overcome challenges, but above all, they've learned to love themselves. The show is called Too Hot to Handle. It looks like this. It makes more sense if it was themed to be unprofessional reality junk food just trashy TV, but it's not. It's treated like a personal growth rehabilitation center. The show has workshops a few times where the contestants will do a group bonding activity in some really weird ways. You can write one or two or three words that represents that very thing that has been holding you back. I'm scared of denial. I'm scared of success. I have fear of disappointing my family. I have fear of not finding love. I have fear of finding love. You're going to write the things that have happened in your life that you're ready to let go of and forgive. Eh, the group isn't showing enough maturity. Let's make them face their past fears and trauma. The whole meaningful connection idea that the show pushes is also ridiculous. Lana punishes people for not forming connections, but really, the contestants having a long-term relationship with each other is a dumb expectation for the show to push, considering the contestants are pulled from around the globe. Here's a visual example of where people come from in each season. Meaningful connections is a garbage cover-up because they can't form long-term relationships when they are used to behaving a very different way and live across the earth. The show format is bad, yes, and it turns out the conclusion of the show is also not satisfying. Spoiler alert for the ending of each season of this show coming up, though I seriously doubt anyone watching this actually cares about spoilers for <laughs> Too Hot to Handle. Um, but in season one, everyone was a winner. So that means people who sabotaged the group's chance of success won, as well as people who formed literally no connections, and in season two, one person won, and three were nominated. The contestants voted among the nominees. One showed personal growth, not necessarily a meaningful connection, but still valuable, and the other two caused the most fun deductions from the group. Honestly, the winner of season two isn't that big of a deal. It was just kind of weird to see who ended up getting nominated through all of that. The show just fails on so many levels, it couldn't possibly 
come through when it comes to the end. Its biggest error though was actually the end of season one because it plays into the behavior of the season two contestants, mainly because it affected the incentive to behave well. So let's talk incentives. The incentive to not break rules is bad. You know how some shows give players immunity, luxury accommodations for a night, a free trip somewhere, something really expensive, just anything like that. Well, this one has watches that give a green light for a genuine connection moment, and this green light gives the couples who have formed the connection one minute to break the rules. A single minute to kiss, kissing squared, woo-hooing, I don't know. They have a single minute with that green light. And then after that, they have to spend all night in a luxury suite that is specifically designed to tempt them. And they're told not to break any rules there. And if they don't break any rules, they win the group back some money. But this challenge was too hard for a lot of people. It was more so a punishment that cost the group a lot of money. If someone formed a meaningful connection, then the chance the group would actually be penalized was huge. So so yeah, the green lights were more so a punishment. Another thing about money being split between everyone is that if no money is lost from the prize fund, everyone should receive around 10 grand. The amount is kind of odd to get right considering they bring people on and remove them at random, but let's just say there's 10 because there are around 10 people in the show. Each person gets 10k USD for staying a month on the show without doing anything with anyone. Which, yes, 10k a month, that's a lot of money for a lot of us, but really, if these people are on this luxury stay for a whole month, with all of these people and activities, you can imagine a stay like that could actually run you 10k. It's an all-inclusive trip for a month, pretty much. So it's like the money divided among them all is more like a cost for staying there, if that makes sense. Plus, it's not like they're losing any money, they just don't gain any. It's not like the producers are gonna hunt them down and take 10k from them, they just don't gain anything. Season 2 contestants thought about all of this and immediately went crazy with breaking rules. Because why not? It's only 10k max split between everyone, right? And it's more likely to dip down to something like 3k per person. So after the contestants went crazy with breaking rules, the show then revealed that only one person would get it at the end of season two. So that corrected their mistake, but really this sort of thing should have been fixed earlier. A common complaint that I agree with as well is that this show doesn't know what it wants to be. With the bizarre cast move arounds and conflicting reward system, the design is poor, but the questionable design of the show doesn't stop there. There's two main hosts. There's Lana, the sentient AI, and there's also a narrator for the whole show who is making jokes the whole time. She's not bad, she's good at what she does, but with this kind of show, the narration gets really awkward at some parts. There are people with some serious tension and chemistry going on, and then there's like some cheesy one-liners being cracked in the background. Damn, they're getting their money's worth. But I'm not gonna fault the narrator for this, I'm sure she's trying her best, it's just the choice to do this in the first place that I blame. It seems like they mixed and matched a bunch of elements without knowing what direction they really wanted to go in. Now on to my favorite segment for each show we're going to talk about, the reviews. This review keeps things simple, it literally just says dumb. This show makes you question everything. A crime against humanity. Torture. Complete trash. Never have I been more grateful to have brain cells. Yeah, you know, I really don't think these people liked it. I mean, the season 1 IMDB audience score was 14%, so this checks out. I was too lazy to find the remote. Worst thing I have ever watched. This is honestly the worst thing on Netflix by far. And trust me when I say that, during this pandemic, I've watched everything else. When you wish there was an apocalypse. All right, now let's look at some reviews defending this show. I love this show. Don't mind any opinion of close-minded people. Of course it's not the most intellectually challenging show, but if you see deeper, you can actually learn something. Humans are fascinating and unique, so it's a pleasure to observe different facets of different characters. I mean, humans are interesting, yes, but... If you want to watch people being interesting, you can watch anything else. There are documentaries on the accomplishments of humans. There are competition shows, cooking shows. Those would probably show how people can be interesting. Or maybe even fiction shows, animated and non-animated, they would still show human accomplishment because they are the byproducts of human achievement. You know, the stuff like set design, acting, CGI, etc. All things fascinating humans have made. I, I just think this person is saying that the people on Too Hot to Handle are interesting to study because of how absurd and, well, stupid a lot of them seem to act at times, which just sounds wrong. <laughs> 
It's like they're treating dumb people like animals. Ah, uh, yes, here we can study the dumb person in their natural environment. Truly fascinating, exquisite creatures. What the hell? <laughs> I don't get all the negative reviews. I understand that some people wouldn't like the show, but the show is not superficial as many reviews would have you believe. The show that casts only hot people and sees if they can resist each other is not superficial? All right, that's a take. That concludes our segment on Too Hot to Handle. Time to turn to the next monstrosity of a show, Love is Blind. Love is Blind, where do I start with this? I guess I'll start with saying, don't watch it. <laughs> the hours you would put into watching this show cannot be taken back, and the show isn't even so bad that it's good. Now, let's summarize the premise. Warning, there will be spoilers in this section for this show as well. Just thought I'd put that out there. But I sincerely hope that avoiding Love is Blind spoilers is not on anyone's priority list. Love is Blind is a show that seeks to test if love is truly blind. I know, shocker. Now, how does the show do this? It casts a bunch of moderately attractive people and gets them to go through blind dating to see if they form a connection. They are in these tiny rooms called the pods, and in these pods they can only hear the person they are dating. They can't see them, nothing. They can only hear their voice. It is beyond awkward. I hate being able to hear people breathe. So what are you looking for in a woman? In shape and beautiful. Aw, oh, that doesn't sound shallow at all. If I had to guess, I'd say you're um, African-American. What makes you think I'm African-American? Just your voice. Who cares what my complexion is? Actually, no, I'm white. Are you? Eventually, after a few dates, some people fall in love, and the goal here is that they propose to each other without seeing each other's face. A few people actually get engaged, and after a couple is engaged, they get to see each other. Once everyone who would be getting engaged does so, the collective group of couples goes on a retreat to Mexico, and here some issues start to become apparent. Some people, <coughs> Jessica, are really having an issue with the idea that love is blind, not really keeping that connection strong. Meanwhile, others are fine. After the retreat, the couples go home, and in this show, unlike Too Hot to Handle, everyone is actually from the same area. Not only are they from the same country, country, America. They're from the same city, Atlanta. They stay in Atlanta for a bit and then eventually the weddings roll around and these weddings are just disastrous. Very embarrassing to watch. Out of the six couples that got engaged, five made it to vows and only two got married. So three weddings had at least one person say no. I do not. I don't. I cannot. The show was a train wreck from start to finish. It was excruciating to get through. And now that you're up to speed on what this show is about, let's get into where it went wrong. My first criticism for this show is how it tries to have an image of itself as an experiment. Like Too Hot to Handle, this show tries to be something more serious than it is, but it's way worse than Too Hot to Handle in this regard because unlike Too Hot to Handle, there is not even a hint of irony here. At least in Too Hot to Handle, a lot of it had irony involved. The workshops were awful, but there was some irony. But in this show, that doesn't really exist. Ladies, welcome to the blind love experiment. Here, you will choose someone to marry without ever seeing them. Will you say I do to the person that you've chosen right here, sight unseen? <laughs> or will physical realities in the real world sabotage you? This literally is the first time an experiment like this has ever been done. We all have to remember this central question. Is love truly blind. They genuinely try to frame this show as an experiment to test if love is truly blind, but it can't effectively do that. It just cannot accurately measure that, and there's a few reasons. Number one, the most excruciatingly obvious one, is that it's a reality show. Couples are going to act differently towards each other in front of a camera for multiple reasons. The first reason would be that, in general, individuals alter their behavior when they're being observed. Apparently this is called the Hawthorne effect, but yes, people change their behavior when being observed. And this is generally accounted for in experiments. Here though, these people aren't just being observed by the people running the experiment, their actions are being viewed by a lot of Netflix viewers. So when the couples are dating in the pods, when their personality and voice are the only measure to go off of, you can't really guarantee that these people are being authentically themselves especially when it pertains to issues that can come under fire like politics. They might just be acting in favor of public perception. Love is Blind also has an extremely big issue regarding their hypothesis. Their idea is 
Let's test if physical appearance can be irrelevant to love. Yet, everyone cast on the show is at least somewhat conventionally attractive. How attractive someone is is subjective, however, it cannot be denied that the casting for this show was done with the Western beauty standard in mind. AKA, love could be blind, but the casting is not. How is it possible to test if people can find love, regardless of looks, when no one here is ugly? The show also doesn't let couples leave the honeymoon phase of their relationship before they have to get married. And the honeymoon phase is that initial butterflies and stomach, extreme attraction phase at the beginning of relationships, generally doesn't last that long, but it lasts much longer than the contestants are given. The honeymoon stage is estimated to last from 6 months to 2 years based on what I looked up, and these people had 10 days to form a connection in the pods, and after meeting each other face to face for the first time, after their engagement, they have 28 days until they follow up with that marriage. So they have a month. Who's to say it's love these people were experiencing instead of some passing infatuation? Aside from its weird claim to be actually testing if love is blind, let's get into my other criticisms. The show is boring. I know that's subjective and I'm definitely not this show's target audience, but I know quite a few reality shows and dating shows appealing to the same audience that outclassed this one by a lot. For example, The Bachelor or Bachelorette. From what I remember about The Bachelor at least, there's a decent amount of drama and there's a good sense of competition. And that keeps the show at least a little bit engaging if reality dating shows are your thing. There's also 90 Day Fiance, which honestly is not the greatest thing to grace this earth. And I have heavily thought about making a video on it, but at least that show is interesting. I have to hand it to TLC here. They know how to edit things to be so dumb, it at least has entertainment value. What you say? Shut up, shut up. What you say? What you say? What you say? What you say? In 90 Day Fiance, there's a lot of arguments and dramatic moments that are played up for TV. And I mentioned The Bachelor and 90 Day Fiance because I needed to illustrate that while they are not fantastic, they are at least not super boring. Unlike this show, there is pretty much no drama and there's too much focus on moments that don't have much emotional impact at all. And the division of screen time in this show is unsatisfactory to say the least. A good chunk of the time is spent on emotionally void moments. When there is conflict in the show, it's actually just upsetting instead of entertaining. Pretty much all of the conflict in the show comes down to a single person. When there are 12 people on the show and all conflict falls on one, it starts to feel really bitter. There's nothing that's really being worked through, it's just one person acting in a way that's insufferable. Now to catch you all up to speed, let me talk about the one who creates the most issues on here. Jessica. There was too much Jessica, it was not pleasant. Let's get into it. Once upon a time in the long lost kingdom of Atlanta, Georgia, there were a bunch of couples who signed up for a Netflix reality show. Don't ask me why, I have no idea. These couples wanted to see if they could find true love. Some did, some did not. But most of these people are irrelevant here. This is a captivating dramatic love story tragedy between Sir Barnett his fiance Amber, Jessica the almighty hypocrite, and Mark. Jessica's love-sick fool. The story begins in the pods. Jessica and Mark found each other and quickly fell in love. Though Jessica was concerned about their relationship due to their age gap, her being in her 30s whilst Mark was in his 20s, they wanted to push through and make things work. For they had many things in common and believed their love could not be swayed so easily. Then came along Barnett. Barnett and Jessica also dated in the pods. They both seemed to like each other as well. However, while Jessica had her heart wanting to go down two separate paths, Barnett had at least three on the go. He eventually set his sights on Amber, and just as he finally made his choice, Jessica made hers. She had just told Mark that they needed to explore the options around them and really make sure they know what they wanted. All of this after so many talks between them of certainty. I get it, you wanna weigh out all your options and be certain. I'm certain, you were certain when you walked out yesterday. I definitely don't wanna jump the gun, you know? It's just the experience for me has been different, like it's worked in different ways for me. 
I'm just trying to like explore everything because we only have like a limited amount of time and it's like the rest of our lives, you know what I mean? AKA after Jessica and Mark were sure they were gonna be together, Jessica basically said, you're not my first choice, bud. So who was her first choice? Barnett. But she did not yet know the feeling wasn't mutual. And this news struck Jessica one fateful night when she decided to ask Barnett a simple question in a game of truth or dare. Just the night before, Barnett said he could propose to her, and Jessica took it very literally. So she asked the following. Is it true that you still feel the same way you felt last night about me? I don't know. Wait, really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. I don't know what's up in my mind. I know I have connections and emotional connections with people. And I don't know how to like differentiate feeling good from, you know, feeling the, you know, L word almost. To go. Why? Because I don't f with people like you. What does that mean? Like I'm not playing this game with you. I'm not trying to play games. I'm trying to feel everything out right now. What are you trying to figure out? My freaking heart, man. Your heart? About what? I just don't know what it's feeling. I'm trying so hard. Oh my so gosh, hard. stop. Now you're trying to figure it out? Like, I know a million guys like you. How dare Barnett want to explore his options with a big decision like marriage on the horizon? That is a right reserved only for Jessica. Barnett is a traitorous, manipulative soul. Meanwhile, Jessica is an all-loving, honest angel. She scribbled into her diary. Basically, Jessica was keeping Mark on the back burner like a rebound in case it didn't work out with Barnett. She thought it was okay to treat people like that. But when Barnett was actually honest about his feelings and said he needed time to feel it out, Jessica deflected all of her motives and manipulative tendencies onto him. So now Jessica is sitting there in defeat. Also, why the hell would she ask a question like that in truth or dare? She really only expected one answer. Like, why would you? It's a, it's a game. Why would you ask a question that you think you already know the answer to? Anyway, back to the story. Now Jessica is sitting there in defeat. Her master plan had backfired. What shall she do now? Well, if she can't have Barnett, then no one can. She proceeds to walk around and try to turn people against Barnett. Her body language reeks of that one popular girl who tries to indoctrinate people into her cult and spread rumors no one actually believes nor cares about. Was that oddly specific? Absolutely not. But who is this she's talking to? Barnett's future wife, Amber. Jessica, how you feeling, friend? Don't let that dude with you. Don't let Barnett with you. What do you mean? I'm just telling okay. you, he's a boy. I just walked out on him. Again, I still strongly believe that everyone's relationship is different. Maybe he's like having issues, but he told me tonight that he just doesn't know what he wants if he's up in his head. That's what he told me. After telling me, he was literally what? She doesn't get very far with her complaints. Jessica goes back to her rebound mark. They get engaged and the tragedy commences. Once the couples arrive in Mexico, Jessica does everything in her power to tell Mark, you are extremely ugly, I didn't expect this, I can't do this, without saying, you are extremely ugly, I didn't expect this, I can't do this. Yeah, I might go shirtless. You're going shirtless? Yep, going shirtless. So the person that I fell in love with was a voice, and now here he is in the flesh, this is him, and I'm struggling a little bit so far in just meshing the two people. Right. I would say he's not the typical guy that I would go for. We could potentially like be in the cuddle zone. Okay. But I'm still getting used to and comfortable with the, us in the flesh, which is so weird. Um, I feel like when you're in the pods, you just get used to a voice. Mark is just existing. She needs to chill. In the midst of making Mark feel bad, she's also on a quest to broadcast her devotion to Barnett. She spends an immense amount of time gushing about him while trash-talking Mark. She even says Barnett is hot to Mark's face. I think Barnett is f***ing and like hot and like... Jessica was determined. She will get Barnett. Though Amber was not going to just hand him over. The odds of Jessica putting up any kind of a fight with me are so low, it's, it's sad. 
Not sad. Laughable. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. Nor was Barnett interested in Jessica in the slightest. There's a scene where she's clearly drunk at a gathering all the couples are at, and she takes the time to talk to Barnett. And here she basically asks him, Are you sure you like Amber? Are you sure you like her? Are you really sure? Are you sure you're sure? So how are you feeling about Amber? Is she everything you expected? Do you feel like you guys are emotionally connected? Like, do you just want to revisit for like a minute, like the fact that like you were so confused two weeks ago? I want to make sure that you're doing what's right for you, you know? I found someone who's gonna love me 100% no matter what. I think so too. Nothing will ever break the bond we I know. made. I know. Literally. We got a friendship. We do, we friendship. and honestly, like, I want the best for you. So like, if anything ever comes up, you, you reach out to me. After all of her extreme, I'm into you messages she sent to Barnett, Barnett finally shut it down and basically said, it seems you still have regrets and still like me, but I have no regrets, so deal with it. And Jessica felt mortified. When we were talking, I guess it felt like, you know, you had regrets about us, maybe. Really? Yeah. Really? I wasn't sure. Regrets you know? about you? Maybe, and I think that pisses oh. me What? I'm mortified. How could he think I like him? Now she thinks I like him. She was baffled. How could he assume that she still likes him? What on earth did she do to make him think that? Anyway, that's the story of Jessica, and the story of Jessica is the main conflict the show focuses on, and is the only thing off the top of my head I can think of that kept me from falling asleep while watching this. And all of this Jessica stuff getting a disproportionate amount of focus really clashes with that whole professional finding love experiment theme they were going for. This segment of the video may have had a disproportionate amount of Jessica too, but hey, at least we know I'm not going for professional. Now let's get on to one of the most insufferable moments of the show, the weddings, particularly the point where the couples must exchange vows. The show creators did something terrible. They decided to shoehorn the show title into all of these ceremonies. Now is the time to decide if love is blind. Now is the time to decide if love is blind. Now is the time to decide if love is truly blind. He said it! He said it! The show started with the question, is love blind? And on this journey to find the answer, they put a bunch of decent looking people together and decided to wing it. The conclusion, six got engaged, one couple immediately separated, five made it to the weddings, three said no. So is love blind? Who knows? This show seems to suggest it's not, but there is one more show that tests this idea that we'll be getting into in a bit. But first, let's look at some Love is Blind reviews. They treat love like an army training camp. This show changed me. I feel like I've gotten dumber after watching two episodes. If they really want to prove love is blind, they should have cast ugly mofos like me instead of a bunch of attractive TV people. I watched every episode. To Netflix's credit, Love is Blind is an addictive reality show, but it's also one that will leave you feeling worse than you started. Call it a guilty displeasure. Proves that even beautiful people can find love. This is utterly nauseated, yet I can't stop watching. What is wrong with me? The cheesy music is the worst. Bleh. Now on to the next abomination. For YouTube purposes, let's call this show Beast. Beast is a show on Netflix that also aims to test if love is blind by getting people to date in animal costumes. I am so single, I'm dressed as a panda bear to try to find a connection with somebody. Can I touch your nose real quick? You can touch it. <laughs> oh my god. It's a no for me. And the show gives immense secondhand embarrassment. It's unforgivable. Let's just roll a montage. Cheers, but how do we drink? That's how dogs do it. I am a dog. Yeah, I do feel it. What you said about me, I was like, ooh, I thought it was pretty hot. <laughs> that was beautiful. Not OK, so do you speak a little bit of Spanish? Un poquito. Oh, OK. Me hab me hab no, he hablo okay. es un divertido un poquito porque me pera si. I like that you try. I did try. So are you like a nerd nerd or are you like a hot nerd? Baby, I'm a, I'm a hot nerd. Yeah. What's most interesting about you? A lot of my friends call me the real life Aquaman. 
I'm a bit of a sneakerhead. Oh, you're a sneakerhead. Look at my kicks. Wait, you can't put it on the table. Oh, yeah, that's bad manners. I just never had a formal date with a woman before. How did your friends describe you? Uh, class clown. The, I can't believe she just did that girl. A Sour Patch Kid. Lunatic. Crazy. Psychopath. Why psychopath? <laughs> you haven't seen my Google search history yet. What about dogs on the bed? That's a no-no. I ain't lying to you. One of them can be my shoes. One of them will be my shoes. Well, how would you feel about a beaver kiss? A beaver kiss? Yeah. Um, we can make it work. The lip I did get behind the teeth was nice. <laughs> the show format works like this. One person is brought on the show looking for love, they get to choose between three people, and they go on one basic bar date with each person. Then someone gets eliminated six minutes into the episode, and you get to see what they look like without the costume. They also get to see the person they were dating. And then with the two remaining participants, the main person goes on a date with each separately at a more unique location. Then with around four to five minutes left in the show, the winner is chosen. And the dramatic reveals on what they look like happen. Now let's get into the criticisms. You know, aside from how every costume looks terrifying and unleashes some deep, instinctual temptation to kick them into the sun. It's not the makeup artist's fault. They did great with the execution. It's the one who drafted this idea. So this show, like Love is Blind, wanted to test the question, is love blind? While using exclusively attractive people. This is revealed at the end of each episode, every single time. They are not bad looking. I mean, sure, some don't fit my preferences, but they're not bad looking. Spoiler warning here again, though I doubt anyone cares. Here's every single costume and reveal in the show. Not really testing our whole Love is Blind thesis here. Now, when these people choose who they're gonna date, the choices are reduced between attractive people, so it's not really a big gamble they're taking if they're hoping they look good. Like Love is Blind, this show is boring, though it's more forgivable because it's shorter and a tiny bit less boring because, well, you know, the animal costumes, but that visual gag can only take you so far. It gets pretty interesting when someone in the costume tries to kiss or is seen drinking, but generally throughout the show, the costume cannot carry the humor. You've already seen it, your eyes adjusted to it, it doesn't retain the shock value it initially generates. The show has a surprising lack of drama or conflict, and there's only one dramatic scene I can think of off the top of my head, and that's where someone was actually thankful for being eliminated. Ethan. Yeah, all right, I'll see you guys, man. I was hoping she would eliminate me. Aside from that, it's relatively peaceful, and as we all know, shows need conflict. Do they need Jessica from Love is Blind conflict? No, but the show needs something more. Whenever someone's face is revealed or someone is eliminated, everyone's just like, oh yeah, okay, that's nice. Yeah, they look pretty, I respect that. And in the real world, that kind of attitude is appreciated, of course, and it's nice to see people be respectful, but when it's on a reality show that has a bit of a competition thing going on, it can't compete. It can't compete with other dating shows. Now my biggest criticism by far is that it feels rushed. Though I'm thankful this show only took up two hours of my time watching it for the first time, it just didn't work. Most dating shows have episodes that are twice as long, but this one only has 22 minute episodes. Someone gets eliminated in the first six minutes. Just so you know, that means everyone is introduced, everyone goes on their first date, and the initial elimination all happens within six minutes. That's a lot. It doesn't give you enough time to really get to know anyone on the show. Luckily though, it does get one of these horrifying things out of your sight pretty quickly. Though due to the short episode length, I'm sure a lot of interesting things or moments are cut. It doesn't have enough content, it goes fast, and there's not enough to be engaging because the editors have to include the essentials only. I would include a review section for the show, however, it's fairly new at the time I finished up recording this video. I couldn't really find much. What I did find, though, was people mainly having an issue with the cast being attractive or the show being boring. Now, let's conclude this deep look into Netflix's deeply saddening reality show business. Too Hot to Handle gets a rating of 3 Lanas out of 10. Love is Blind gets a rating of 2 Jessicas out of 10 and Beast gets a rating of two dolphin ladies out of 10. Not great. Overall, it seems like Netflix is trying to speed run their reputation as a streaming platform to mockery tier. That pretty much sums up where I'm at at this point. Thank you all for watching this video. You viewer, you honestly deserve a pat on the back seeing this stuff. I mean, that's hard. 
congratulate yourself, reward yourself, take time off work or whatever you need to. Just be kind to yourself after this. And if you want to check out my social media or merch, I have links in the description. Thank you all for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh, every night is like a day. But oh, I'm feeling crazy as I know I'm running late. Let's wait just one more day. I know I'm running away from moments. What am I becoming? I guess something's broken. <laughs>